Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very first In Rhythm Design Sprint, where we're going to be imagining a regenerative economy. It's really awesome to see so many familiar faces, but also so many new faces. And, you know, just from the In Rhythm team, uh, we're really grateful that you're taking the time out of your days to join us for this webinar and this conversation. My name's Alex, um, and I'm joined by my team members, Trey and Jen and Jeff here today. And, you know, so many incredible people from our, our network here at InRhythm as well. Um, so for those of you who are maybe not familiar with us, uh, we're a design and management consultancy dedicated to revealing potential in people and in organizations. And so today in this hour, we're gonna spend, uh, yeah, the next 60 minutes going through a design process to reimagine our economic system. Uh, this is gonna be led by my team member, Trey, and we've got the amazing John Fullerton here joining us. Um, so just briefly a little bit about John, although we'll give him space to share more about himself in a minute. John's the founder and president of the Capital Institute, and he is the author of Regenerative Capitalism. He's widely recognized around the world as a thought leader in the new economy space and on the future of capitalism. And yeah, he's an active impact investor and previously was a managing director of JP Morgan. John's going to share more about his story in a little bit. And we're just super excited to have him here with us today to kind of go through this design sprint together on reimagining our, re our economic system. Um, and we'll tell you more about how we're gonna do that in a second, but just a couple of little logistics before we dive in. Um, so we wanna make this webinar as dynamic and as engaging as possible. So encourage you, I see a lot coming through the chat, just encourage you to keep, keep using that, engage there and the In Rhythm team will do our best to engage back and make this really dynamic. Um, for the, a, a lot of people are already doing this, but love to hear where you're calling in from. If you're here with an organization, feel free to mention that. It's always a cool way to make connections. And also if there's anything you wanna mention about what's exciting about this topic to you, I think that'd be awesome to know as well. Um, one little logistic thing about uh, Zoom, which I'm sure you're all experts at at this point, but in the top right corner, you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view. And I just encourage you for this conversation to use uh, speaker view so that you know you can really have a view of the conversation and then maybe towards the end if we engage in any discussion we can move that so maybe just give me a thumbs up if you're able to toggle to speaker view okay great i'm hearing some i'm hearing some thumbs up i'm hearing some thumbs up so if and if anyone has any issues just ping us in the chat and we can give you a hand figuring that out um, and then lastly this webinar is being recorded and shared so you'll have access to it afterwards and yeah, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Trey to kick off the webinar today. Great. Thank you, uh, Alex. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm super excited, as always, to see people from all over the world uh, wanting to learn more about what does regeneration look like in the context of our lives. And, and today, as Alex said, we're going to be talking about what regeneration looks like from an economic uh, viewpoint and standpoint. And the intention is to be able to have a conversation. So what you'll notice today in this is it's not going to be a typical webinar. It's going to be a conversation around what regenerative economies or a new economy would look like. And uh, as Alex said, we're super excited to have John Fullerton here with us. And I have known John for over a decade. Uh, we were involved in some doing some regenerative agricultural work together as and being an advisor and investor in a lot of those kinds of um, projects and, and me being in a position of uh, supporting the implementation of a lot of that work. And so we've had the chance to really get to know each other over a long period of time, uh, seeing things emerge in lots of different ways. And, and we thought this would be a great way for us to continue to honor what work he is already doing and leading in this space and to talk about it in a way that allows us to land it uh, in real specific, uh, what we call at in rhythm operational ways. And, and so with that, I'm going to uh, uh, ask John, John, would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself, your background, and then we'll kind of get into a conversation. <clears throat> sure, Trey, and, and uh, great to be with everyone uh, on, a, on a Zoom a Zoom call. I, my wife always laughs at me when I put on a collared shirt. She knows I'm on a Zoom today, so uh, <laughs> I dressed up for everyone. I hope you appreciate it. Um, 
So my, um, and, and the other thing I have to say, Alex, is no one told me this is the first time you've done a Zoom or a, a, a design sprint. So I guess we're, I'm the guinea pig here, but I look forward to that. Um, so really briefly, I, my story uh, is, um, went straight to Wall Street out of college. I uh, went to what I like to call the old JP Morgan, a very different culture than the modern JP Morgan. And, um, and had a great career for almost 20 years. Um, had the luck and fortune of riding the derivatives wave um, uh, before derivatives became a dirty word and uh, ended up doing private equity, venture capital, and, and really began uh, responding to kind of a tug that was telling me it was time to do something different, that there was something profoundly wrong with our, our financial system and the, and the, um, the kind of money-driven culture of it. And it, this was before the financial crisis. So this was back in 2001 when I ultimately left uh, JP Morgan. So it wasn't a response to some major ethical breaches or anything. It was more just a kind of a silent inner voice calling me uh, or pulling me away. And, and uh, to make a long story short, I left in 2001, took the summer off and the first day I spent thinking about my next, um, next move in my, in my career and in my life, happened to be 9-11. I had a meeting downtown that morning at 9.30, so I unfortunately experienced that very much up close and personal. And that really helped push me into an even deeper kind of introspective period. Um, started reading tons of books, which wasn't what I was normally in inclined to do. And um, discovered, um, I discovered the environmental crisis as a systemic issue. I discovered there was such a thing called system science. And I ultimately concluded that a lot of these interconnected problems that we see from, uh, from the cl climate crisis to other environmental crises to the grotesque inequality that our system tends to foster um, were actually rooted in the economic system design. And as a finance guy, I knew very well that finance, finance ideology, financial um, uh, decision making is what very much drives the economic system and drives our policy making framework. So it was really one of these kind of epiphanies where I realized it was all these guys like me who think they're so smart who are actually driving our our global economy and, and therefore our society off a cliff. And um, so I began to wrestle with this question of what an economy that actually worked for both uh, humanity and, and, uh, and the biosphere might look like. And, and uh, knowing I wasn't smart enough to figure that out, I, I landed on this idea, which is not a new idea, that, that if we look to the, the wisdom and the brilliance of how living systems work, uh, we might find clues for how a human economy could work if it's to be sustainable the way living systems are. And, and the, you know, the final icing on the cake is I discovered that living systems happen to work very much in congruence with the indigenous wisdom that is the only human culture that has stood the test of time. So we, we have a, a kind of a choice. We can either continue pretending that we can run our human economy in conflict with living systems principles and our ancestors' wisdom, or we can figure out how to align the human economy and the financial system that drives it with those same patterns and principles. So that's the gist of, of the work and what I'm up to. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Um, so in the process of you beginning to kind of discover, it was both a personal one as well as kind of a, a professional one. And what, what was the challenge for you in terms of kind of your own personal journey through this and then translating that into the work that you were going to do? Well, the, you know, the personal challenge was I was a, you know, early 40s, competitive, successful man, um, driven to prove myself and make a career and all that good stuff. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me and why I didn't want to keep doing what I was doing. And, uh, and I started putting together business plans and PowerPoints on what I thought I wanted to do next and nothing was really gaining traction. And so really it was this 
uh, again, another discovery, this discovery of this idea of synchronicity um, that, that actually led me to you, Trey. I don't know if I've ever shared this story, but I, I, um, I discovered this idea of synchronicity, the idea that there are coincidences that aren't really coincidences. And if we pay attention to them, there's a pattern and, and really are, uh, in my case, my future um, life kind of revealed itself through these coincidences. And one of the most profound ones was that I, I wrote a paper back in like 2008 called The Relevance of E.F. Schumacher in the 21st Century. And coincidentally, someone had to send it, must have sent it to, it was put out on the web by the Schumacher Society. And out of the blue, I get an email from a guy called Alan Savory, who was writing from um, uh, Zimbabwe. And um, uh, he had, you know, saw in me something that made sense and that connected us together. And I ended up um, investing in a business with Savory Institute, managing grasslands and learning about holistic land grazing and, and really, um, and therefore meeting Trey, but really planted the seed of this idea that if living systems can make grasslands regenerate, why wouldn't living systems principles be uh, capable of making a human economy regenerate? So, so to answer your question, it was really the, this idea of letting go of my ego-driven will to find a path and, um, and allow, you know, this is gonna sound a little bit, a little bit airy-fairy, but kind of allow the universe to help me find a path. And that's been uh, really a, a um, a powerful insight and, and really very much my, my, way of, my way of making big decisions in my life now. As, as always, just hearing uh, the story of your, your story and the stories of others becomes extremely inspirational to all of us as we're continuing to define what this journey is. Um, when, you, when you think about um, regeneration, um, I think it would be good for us to just talk about that first as we're talking about living systems, it, this idea of a regenerative economy. What, what, what do you think differentiates a regenerative economy from what would be a typical or conventional economy? Hmm. Um, so I, I guess the, you know, the, the, I, well, I mean, there's, I don't know, I'm not quite sure where to start, but certainly, certainly the most important difference is that the outcome would be one that is, um, that feels like flourishing, abundance, beauty, uh, permanence, um, all of the things that our common sense would tell us we want our economic system to, to achieve. Um, and, and it wouldn't be defined by, you know, wealth creation, extraction, pollution, destruction, um, you know, degenerativeness, um, chaos, um, uncertainty, uh, fear, um, abuse, uh, violence, and unfortunately, all those words are words that, if we're honest, describe what our economic system does produce, even though it also has produced vast um, uh, progress and, and, um, and material wealth and well-being and livelihoods and dignity and whatnot for many, many, many people. Um, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you're healthy, except for that little bit of cancer, you still have cancer. And, um, and we need a system that is healthy, not healthy except for this problem, that problem, and that problem. And, and um, so I, I guess that's how I would, I guess I'd answer your question by saying what, what it achieves, what is the outcome that it achieves. So when you think about the underlying purpose of a regenerative economy, then outside of what it, it achieves, um, what, what do you think is uh, the, the underlying motivations that both um, 
inspire you and those around you to design that um, in a way that the way you described it is a, a complete sense of health, right? Um, mm -hmm. Everything about that system is regenerating, you know, that, that intense well-being. Um, you've utilized and talked about that using some principles that you've written about quite extensively. Do you want to talk about some of those when you talk about what's the underlying conditions that create those outcomes you're talking about? Sure. So, you know, not to, not to sort of um, uh, fall into kind of a lecture format on eight principles, but, um, but the, the idea is, uh, is that, well, let me, let me go step back even further. So, so we have this economic system that all of us geniuses and economists and financial whiz bangs think is great. And we, you know, we're proud to say it's the best system we've ever had. And, you know, if you think capitalism is bad, try communism, try socialism. And so we have this kind of myopic view that our choices are between, you know, communism or even socialism and a big bureaucratic state and all kinds of bad things happening and, or this free enterprise capitalist system. And yeah, there's going to be some bumps and bruises, but it's better than any alternative. And we, we pretend as if those are the two uh, choices we have. And and then we're stuck in our ideological debate around whether what's the role of government and do we let this free market just run or do we tame it with government policies? Again, as if those are the two choices. And um, you know, there, for me, being stuck in that false choice tells me that we're literally lost. We we are we are down a road and. W the road doesn't lead where we want it to go, and we're so far down the road, we can't even find our way back to where the fork in the road happened and, and find a new path. So we're, we're lost, and we're just rearranging deck chairs. And frankly, it doesn't matter whether we elect one guy or another guy or one woman and another woman, because all of the leaders in our uh, modern culture are arguing over how to create economic growth, which is extractive, uh, in nature, and maybe we want it to be a little less extractive and a little more clean energy and a little more this, but, but the premise of our, our economic ideology is that our well-being comes from economic growth. And we're, we're not acknowledging the fundamental flaw in this, which is that exponential economic growth is in conflict with a finite planet. And that's, that's physics and biology and chemistry. That's not ideology of the left or the right. And, you know, we can get into a debate about how much we can make things more efficient and circular economy and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it's blah, 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 because we are 7 billion people going to 9 billion people all trying to raise their standard of living in a system that is inherently extractive to some degree, depending on technology. And it doesn't, it simply doesn't work anymore, any more than you know, you can go into a forest and cut down 10 trees and there's not a problem, but you cut down 100 trees, still not a problem. You cut down a million trees, you don't have a forest. And so we're at that moment in time. And so for me, getting back to kind of first principles, uh, the underlying patterns of systems that we know work, which are living systems, which are living because they've managed to sustain themselves. If we can get clear on, on descriptive principles and descriptive patterns of how those systems work and then admit that we too are living systems, our bodies are living systems, our communities are living systems, um, and therefore our economy needs to behave like a living system. If we accept that as, as a premise, which I do, and I'm happy to debate that, but if we accept that as a premise, what's critical is to get clear on on the, the least number of core principles that is descriptive enough to help us find our way as if it's a, you know, a compass. And so I've written about eight, the, the, you know, as Jeff Sue likes to say, it, it, isn't the, it isn't the eight that represent truth. The, what is truth is that there's this thing called a living system. And so my, my description is my fingers pointing at the moon and your description might be your fingers pointing at the moon but we don't want to confuse our fingers with the moon. So we're, we're trying to describe the moon. 
that can't be reduced to linear English language. And, um, you know, for better or worse, I've come up with eight. Others might come up with six. Others would better define it with 12. But the point is that we need to acknowledge that we need to figure out how living systems work and then find out where our economy is in conflict with that and, um, and start whittling away at those differences. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe I'll give one concrete example just to, to uh, demonstrate how this might work. Uh, again, going to the, um, starting with the field of finance, you know, there's been, a, there's now an industry of sustainable finance. And uh, it's been around now for over 25 years. Its biggest accomplishment is probably this idea of ESG, and um, which stands for environmental, social, and governance. And so we now analyze big companies and, and rate them on their environmental, social, and governance uh, um, uh, behavior. And, um, and, and we even have portfolio managers who use those as factors to decide which companies to own. But we've, we've, we've missed the fundamental point, which is that one of the principles, and I don't think, I don't think anyone who understands living systems would debate this, this idea of right relationships, symbiotic relationships is central to healthy living systems. And they need to be in, in, um, in a win-win arrangement, just like you know, this is true at a cellular level in our body, but it's also true the relationship between planet Earth and our sun is just right, or we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have life on this planet. So if, if right relationship is a fundamental principle, um, if you look at the way modern capitalism and modern capital markets, what they've done to modern business, modern enterprise, it's severed the relationship between investors and enterprises. It used to be that people owned companies and, um, uh, and had you know, a say in the way the company works, just like if you own a, a house, you, you're responsible for keeping your roof uh, and, your, and your lawn tidy and your roof from leaking. But now we essentially have displaced ownership, true ownership and the responsibility that goes with it with a speculative casino. And so people are trading shares and using the data to figure out how to trade short-term shares. And we've lost the relationship between real investors and real enterprises. And so all of the ESG in the world is never gonna heal our global corporate economy because we're, we've breached this fu one fundamental principle, which is having right relationships. So imagine if you had a big pension fund that owned 10% of a big company and had a board seat, the relationship they would have with that company is very different than if that company's shares are sitting in a, in a stock portfolio that are traded in and out, whether it's hourly or even every year, um, you don't have the same kind of relationship. So the point is, if we use these principles to check how we organized our economy, what the structures of our economy actually are, one of the dominant structures of our economy is public capital markets. And they're in conflict with how living systems work. So all of the tweaking in ESG and regulation in the world is never going to reconnect that fundamental uh, relationship. And that's, you know, that's one example of one of eight principles. Um, they, they all need to work together to have a healthy system, to have a, a holistic approach to, to defining health. Great, thank you. Actually, you, you led right into a series of questions I was gonna ask around it. And you said like currently the public markets are a structure that our current economy is really developed and built on. If you had to design a different structure, what would it be? I'm sure you've dreamed about it. You've thought about it. Well, so you mean for that specific piece? It could so, be that one. Or if you yeah. think of, when you're thinking about kind of the underlying structures for a regenerative economy, uh, what, what is the other structures that you think may yeah. need to exist for that to, uh, to serve us? So, um, well, let's just talk about the, you know, the, the, the public corporations are not the entire economy. We, we get, a, we get a, a, an inaccurate sense of that because of the media's focus on the stock market. But uh, the, the, the largest 1,000 public corporations represent a very meaningful piece of the global economy. And particularly if you include their supply chains and 
So, so we, you know, we obviously can't ignore it either. But, but the first thing is to say that is not the economy, and uh, much of the most regenerative business that I've experienced and seen and am involved in is involved in non-public companies. Um, and and if you, you know, you think about you know one of the well-known sustainable brand companies that we all know about, Patagonia. Well, it's no coincidence that Patagonia is a private company and doing a lot of these things. Um, you know, another, another example is, is Ray Anderson's um, um, uh, company, you know, before he passed away, uh, Interface. Interface was a public company, a carpet company, but it was controlled by Ray Anderson because of a uh, super voting shares that he owned. So he had a disproportionate amount of control than most CEOs of public corporations. You know, there are corporations in Europe, particularly in Scandinavia, that are owned by foundations. And so they have a very different mandate and a much longer time horizon than a typical public corporation. But these are very big companies that are managed in a very different way. So, um, you know, I, I think the first thing is we need to, you know, figure out what's the tail and what's the dog or whatever the expression is. And, um, and we, you know, second, in, in finance, um, uh, in, in, in financial markets, we literally refer to public markets as either primary markets or secondary markets. And a primary offering is like an, an IPO. When a company first goes public, it's first selling its shares to the public. We call that a primary offering because it's new shares. The money actually goes into the company and the company builds new factories or does whatever it's going to do with the money, at least theoretically. These days in reality, what it does is, is a way for the venture capitalists to cash out. But that's a conversation for another day. But, but then there's this thing we call the secondary market. And it's called a secondary market for a reason, which is it's secondary shares trading. So I own a share of IBM and I sell it to Trey and Trey buys IBM and sells Exxon. And that's just this game of secondary trading. But we now consider that the core business of Wall Street. And we measure portfolio returns of this secondary trading as if it's the primary thing. So it's, it's actually, uh, we're confusing the means and the ends. And, and people have built businesses out of being secondary traders when really secondary trading should be seen as kind of the plumbing of, of something that's of, of the capital formation process, which is what's important about capital markets. So to answer your question, you know, in my ideal world, I would see, um, and, and you know, there's easy ways to shift, to, to, to make these changes. They involve carrots and sticks. You know, um, we, we, we need a tax system and an incentive system that penalizes what we don't want and incentivizes what we do want. Mm. We have just the opposite. We penalize work by having our core tax system uh, linked to labor and, uh, and we incentivize speculative returns to capital with a capital gains uh, a benefit and all kinds of ways for speculators to avoid um, paying taxes legally. So what I would do, and I, I've, I've lobbied for this, you know, this goes back 10 years, but a financial transaction tax is no panacea, but if we taxed small amounts, small tax on the gazillions of shares that trade every day, that would make trading less profitable because a lot of trading is essentially collecting pennies on small little trades that have nothing to do with the real economy. And that's a massive waste of our resources. And, you know, there's a whole argument about it. market efficiency, blah, blah, blah. I'm happy to have that debate. I've had that debate. And our ideology, you know, both the Democrats and the Republicans couldn't get their heads around this, you know, eight years ago because they, they were drilled by the economists to think that we're reducing market efficiency and that has to be bad for growth. It's just, it's, all, it's simply all wrong. So I would, you know, and, and I've written this in my paper on um, finance for a regenerative world, which is sort of the sequel to regenerative capitalism. It's up on our website um, if, it, if folks are interested. It's, it's long, it's a book. Um, but, you know, I would argue that we should have a combination of financial transaction taxes and a modification of the capital gains tax that would literally um, uh, cause more than half of the secondary trading in, in capital markets to, to, to go away. And so it would shrink Wall Street by an order of magnitude. And that would leave a lot of people very unhappy, uh, a lot of people that have a lot of power. But it would shift resources 
human, most importantly, but human resources, capital, technology, out of this secondary trading game, which is the tail wagging the dog, and force it into more productive uses. And then if at the same time we had a, an incentive, um, like capital gains, um, uh, you know, a, a, a reduced capital gains tax for the things we want people to invest their capital in, um, such as, hey, how about renewable energy for an idea? Uh, how about regenerative agriculture for an idea? Uh, all of those things should be re receiving subsidies that are paid for by the taxes on the stuff we don't want to have happen just within the financial system itself. And it, at the result, at the end of that, you know, mom and pop in their 401k would still be able to invest in Disney and Coca-Cola and, and uh, IBM if they wanted to, um, but they would be more inclined to become long-term investors rather than get caught up in this speculative game. And, and the big institutional investors like the pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds would actually stop owning a tiny slice of everything, which is what is deemed to be uh, responsible investing today. And they would own meaningful shares of a handful of companies. Are you still there, Trey? Oh, you yes. went away. <laughs> um, they would own a meaningful share of, of, of a number of companies and take board seats and be responsible for the behavior of those companies. And I think it's a complete um, abrogation of responsibility of these multi-billion and hundred billion dollar pools of capital to be passive speculators in the, in the stock market. Awesome. Thank you. I'll stop. Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm going to keep asking questions because part of what we're trying to do is get a sense of how you imagine that new design to be. And so I wanted to ask, along with those potential changes in design, uh, talk to me about what local looks like. I mean, we've got these global, we've got all these things that are happening in this kind of high level meta system design, but uh, there's also this really strong movement back to, so what's happening in our communities and how do you reconcile and yeah. work that into the structure? So great. And again, I only talked about one principle. Another principle in my paper, again, my language, but, but people can use whatever language they like. I, I, I call it honors community in place. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> just as right relationship and imbalance and edge effect are principles, so is honoring community in place in my framework, which means it's, it's equally as important. It's not like, well, I can do this one and not that one. So what does honors community in place mean in the context of our globalized economy? Well, obviously the first thing it means is, oops, we got a problem if everything is moving toward globalization. And so the fact that there is this movement toward local is completely consistent with the emergence of a regenerative economy. And, and one of the things, and Trey and I, we've talked about this many times, that the thing that's most hopeful is that this regenerative economy thing is already emerging. It's just that we don't see it as that. We see it, and here's a perfect case in point. We see there's a local movement. And so local must be the thing. Well, no, local isn't the thing. Local is a quality of a regenerative system that honors community in place, but it's not the answer to our economic problems. So it's not simply local, but yes, we need to ground our economic system again in the um, unique context of, of place. And why is place important? And, and I, you know, I, again, pretty much everything that I will say I've learned from others. So this is not, again, my idea. And in this case, we're Genesis Group, uh, who's one of the real leaders and practitioners in this whole regenerative movement, very much is focused on the, play, on, on the built environment in place. In fact, you know, I first discovered holism and, and regenerative agriculture with Alan Savory, and then I bumped into the Regenesis Group, and they were doing similar work, but in the context of the built environment in place. So now I had two data points and I immediately extrapolated that this must be the, the, the pattern. And so I assumed it had to work for the entire economy, which is of course a, a bit of a leap of faith. But, um, but getting back to place, what, what's, what's, what's critical about place is it, it's where uh, the geologic reality of this planet uh, interacts with and interfaces with human culture. So, you know, I live in the Northeast um, 
and and uh, the region, I, I grew up on Long Island Sound and the region, the Long Island Sound estuary, and really all the way up to Cape Cod, has a very distinct feeling. Um, and I know when I'm in that place and I feel at home in that place. And it's very different even from where you get up to, you know, north of Boston and the coast of Maine. It's still, fractally, it's connected. It's still an extension of the Northeast, but it's a different place. And even more different is if you go up the Hudson Valley, which is still in the Northeast, but if you go up the Hudson Valley up toward Vermont, you get a very different cultural feeling. And it turns out there's a very different uh, geology up there. And so the, the vision of a regenerative economy would be one that is stitched together and built from these place-based um, grounded culturally significant places and a, and a resilient place-based economy. But that simply becomes the foundation of a more complex system of local trade and international trade. Um, but you can't do the international trade. What we did with globalization is we assumed we could just go straight to the most efficient international trade and it doesn't matter what happens to the place and the local. But of course, that needs to be a resilient base in order to um, rise to this higher level of complexity. But we went for the higher level of complexity without the, the foundation. So we, we built a global economy on a foundation of sand in many ways. And, and the, um, the destruction of rural America and the destruction of um, uh, small towns is simply the, the inevitable consequence of, of de having an economic system that is in conflict with the fundamental, I'll call them laws of living systems. Just like if you, um, you know, one of the principles I talk about is robust circulation. Well, if your feet are not um, uh, empowered to, another one is called empowered participation. So if your feet are not empowered to participate in the circulation of oxygen, your feet are gonna get sick. Eventually you can't walk. If you can't walk, you can't be healthy. But most importantly, you can't realize your potential as a human being. So it's, it's not a choice. You, you, we can't have uh, unhealthy place-based local economies and have a healthy global economy. And guess what? We have Brexit, we have Trump, we have um, all of the, the political chaos that we're living through right now. Um, we even have a pandemic. So the, the consequences of this unhealthy system are manifesting. We have climate change. Um, so it's, it's not like this is a theory. This is actually simply describing what is. And equally important, the, the regenerative movement is taking place very much from the ground up. Um, at, at a bioregional scale. And so again, it's not a theory, it's actually an emergent property. And, and that's how living systems adopt. They, they, they respond to pressure. And so where the pressure is greatest, which is not on Wall Street, but it's on Main Street and it's in rural communities, that's where all this work is actually happening. And again, that's just what the science would tell you would happen. One of the things that we also see in living systems is that incredible diversity that exists to create the resiliency across the system. When you think about, and you've mentioned Alan Savory, holistic management, you've mentioned Regenesis. You know, is there anybody else, you've mentioned um, Schumacher, is there anybody else that you think has really inspired you that actually really influenced your thinking in this, sure. that really expanded and allowed for this to emerge in this real meaningful way? Yeah, there's, there's tons of people. And I, I, I always hate this question because A, my memory sucks. And so I always forget people. And B, even if I remember, I'll, I'll neglect to say someone and I'll say someone else and create more enemies than friends. But, um, but having, so, so having said that, this is a very limited list. But, but at least today, what pops up to mind um, you know, I have to put Dana Meadows probably at the top of the list, uh, reading limits to growth, um, probably in 2004 was the real, uh, for, for, you know, to use Ray Anderson's expression, spear in the chest for me. Um, it, it, it was this holy shit moment. Um, you know, w w people who in 19, in the 1970s, at MIT figured out that if you just continue playing the game as we're playing it, 
you know, the system would collapse. And, you know, I had the benefit of reading that once you could look in the rear view mirror and then see that it actually was playing out just as they predicted. Um, that is the, sort of the foundation piece for me. And of course, they weren't the first to figure this out. Um, um, but, but for me, that was, um, that's sort of the seminal piece of work that should be required reading. Uh, I would venture to say most economists today either have never read it or have dismissed it as irrelevant and neo-Malthusian sky is falling alarmism and haven't studied that it's actually turned out to be a, a very accurate forecast. Um, you know, I have to, I have to hand a huge amount of my re-education credit to Herman Daly and his work as the, really the founder, he and, and Bob Costanza founded the, this idea of, um, in a field of ecological economics. And ecological economics is not to be confused with environmental economics, which, um, you know, most recently in 2018, we awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics to William Nordhaus for his work uh, developing an economic model that calculated the optimal global warming we should shoot for those three and a half degrees Celsius because anything lower would cost too much in terms of growth. <laughs> we literally, literally, this is true, you can look it up. In 2018, we awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics to a man who developed a model that said we shouldn't shoot for three degrees or three and a quarter degrees, much less two degrees, much less one and a half degrees because it would cost too much. Um, so ecological economics is quite different than that, and it, it introduced for the first time the idea of scale to economic thinking. And, and that's, that, was the, that was the piece that changes everything about how we think about economics, just like if you're in a life raft uh, and uh, you've got 10 gallons of water uh, and you've got 10 people, uh, the, the, the scale of the water buckets are what matters. And, um, and there's no faucet to keep filling the fresh water. So you have to think very differently around your entire system of survival. Mm. Um, gosh, I, I um, definitely highlight those two. Um, uh, Fritjof Capra, in terms of systems science, um, you know, uh, Gaia theory, uh, which Lynn Margolis and um, um, having a mental block, help me. James of Luck. Uh, James Lovelock, thank you. The, the idea that the earth itself is a living system is a profound um, awakening, I think, that we all need to connect with um, and not see the earth as just a, a rock with stuff in it that we can take. Um, uh, oh, I want to mention, um, uh, who's the, I'm again blanking, the, the woman who, um, uh, save New York City from the highway system. Um, Jane Jacobs. Thank you. Who helped us there? Lisa. Jane Jacobs. Um, Jane Jacobs is one of the heroes that the giants of this whole, you know, she, she, her name should be forever attached to the regenerative economy movement. She talked about uh, a systems approach to uh, to economic systems or economic design. And, um, and yet she's renowned for her work in, you know, urban uh, planning. And so um, she's sort of missed when people talk about um, this idea. So, but, you know, but frankly, the, the, this thinking goes all the way back to Aristotle and Goethe. And uh, I mean, there's just an endless number of folks that are, um, uh, that are, have been saying this in various ways for, for a very long time. And um, so John, when you, when you mentioned that last one, I was just going to ask part of what we think about in structures is what, what is it that opens the, the exchange or the flow of information from people who are doing good work within the system, right? So if you had to recommend, how, how do you increase the, that communication? How, do, how does one part of the system know that the other part of the system is working and working well? Is there anything that you've thought through or thought about that would really increase that flow of information? Uh, sure. Um, in fact, I, I, have to, I have to go back to the prior question and make two more, uh, okay. yeah. two more quick comments. Um, so Bucky Fuller, I discovered 
most of Bucky Fuller I can't understand, but um, but but uh, I was given his his last book is a little short book called Grunch, and it was his critique of capitalism, and in that he talked about regenerative universe, and essentially said what I'm saying, which is if we can uh, we we now understand the universal patterns of 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 life, and if we can align our economy with it, we'll we'll do fine. And uh, you know, this was literally his sort of farewell message to humanity. So, the unspoken words were, "If we don't do that, we're we're not fine." Um, but the other thing I discovered again very recently is that the um, the alchemists the, the, there's sort of three types of Christian mystics, and one of them were the alchemists. And uh, according to what I've read, which is a fairly scholarly treatise on on mysticism. Uh, Regeneration was the quote watchword of the alchemists. So again, this is this is simply remembering what we humanity have known for a very long time and um, uh, and putting in into practice in a modern context. Um, now, with respect to sort of uh, how to increase the awareness of this, I mean, one of my other teachers, Sally Gorner, uses the you know sort of asserts that the network is the metaphor for the integral age. So just like the machine is the metaphor for the modern age, the network is really the metaphor for the inter what, what many people are calling the integral age. And, um, and networks are how living systems take change to scale. So, you know, not to try to be smarter than nature, what did we do? Well, we started something called the Regenerative Communities Network, which is again, built on the eight principles, the idea of building a regenerative economy uh, from the ground up, organized at the bioregional level, um, but but not that we Capital Institute are going to go build a, a global economy or a regenerative economy, but rather we wanted to create the connective tissue so that the bioregionally based regenerative initiatives in one region can see what's happening in another region and learn from each other and see the common patterns and principles, even though the contexts are very different. So I just like to say. You know, and, and by the way, this, this applies to everything in the universe, right? If it's, if it's universal. So every snowflake is unique, but every snowflake looks like a snowflake. So every regenerative economy is unique, but every regenerative economy looks like a regenerative economy. And, and my, um, my contribution to this conversation is that the eight principles describe what's common about a truly regenerative economy. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, we need a network. And turns out networks are a thing. And turns out networks have arrived just in time, which means that you know the the internet is the emergence of the regenerative economy. It it creates potential for us to communicate in a way and share robust circulation, not just of energy and materials, which is what the circular economy is focused on, but the robust circulation of information and of empathy and of knowledge. And so we can use that tool. It showed up just in time for us to be able to do this on a global scale. And so imagine, you know, first 10, then 100, then 1,000 bioregionally based regenerative economies all connected into one regenerative economy through a network. And that's the, that's the vision of the Regenerative Communities Network, which I'm delighted to say and proud to say that, that in rhythm is that has taken on the, the stewardship of and, and is, is, uh, is working in service of uh, that process. Mm, awesome. So we're here getting closer to the end, top of the hour, and, and I was just going to ask, if you were to recommend people, if, if they wanted to work in a way that would be meaningful, to put this um, whole process to work, what, what would be some recommendations? How do you imagine them to actually start doing this kind of, and, what, and how would you define that work that they should all be doing? Well, I don't know if there's a right answer. I don't, there is no answer to that question, honestly. Um, I mean, it, it, I, I, think, I think the most important thing is to begin with each and each, you know, at, with our own self. And, um, right. and, you know, you guys at In Rhythm are, are way better experts at this than I am. But if I look to my own journey, it, it very much began with this self-reflection and and discovering who I really was and not who I was trying to be um, because the culture said that's what you're supposed to be. And, um, and I think the rest of it 
this is going to, again, sound a little bit um, uh, woo-woo maybe, but I, I think if we all had, and, I, and I, I had a great privilege to be able to do that because I worked on Wall Street for 20 years and I didn't have the pressure of a mortgage to go pay and whatnot the, 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 day, the day I quit my job. And so I had some time to reflect. So, you know, I, I think if we can create space for ourselves to reflect and really, again, going back to early wisdom, know thyself and figure out your unique essence. Mm. There is a place in this, by definition, it's the empowered participation of each of our unique essence that will make this happen. Mm. So, you know, if you're an artist, that has one implication. Or if you're a lawyer, that has one implication. If you're a finance guy, that has one implication. If you're a, um, a homemaker and making home for a family, that has one implication. And, um, uh, and I, don't think there's a, I don't think there's one answer. Ha having said that, um, there is this energy emerging around these place-based initiatives. And, um, and, and the key to that is to begin to see your local economy, which you know, we all can relate to, we all care about. Uh, and it begins there with food systems. So there, there's a reason why food systems are so um, important and topical because we've got the most reductive, extractive, degenerative food system you could possibly design. Mm. And so where, why not a better place to start? And by the way, it's destroying our health, which by the way, the COVID crisis has told us in case we were confused that uh, the resiliency of our health and our immune systems is fundamental. So why not start there? Um, that's, I guess, what I would. Begin. It's great. I mean, I, I of course, wouldn't um, have anything else to add other than just emphasize how powerful starting with the individual and working into those other nested systems are and to right. recognize that, you know, something that relates across all of it is something like food. You know, it, it, it's something to be um, cherished and stewarded as well as a way that continues to ground us in living systems as a a means to to know that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. So I think that's great. I think we have way, a if we shift our food system. It's the most hopeful solution to climate change I'm aware of. So these are the key to the regenerative thing is you un unlock potential to solve multiple problems at one time. Yeah, um, because of the systemic nature of it. And, and I and I do think it's powerful to recognize that a context for how we would design that is this kind of regenerative, higher quality of life that's more meaningful behaviors that are in line with what it is that is supportive or reciprocal, uh, right relationship, that larger environment of, of recognizing that if we are putting the conditions in place to then see those economic systems show up in regenerative agriculture, in the food system, in the healthcare, in education and all that. To me, that, that's all the work that we've got to do is continuing to bring this to life in those contexts exactly. as a part of it. And then the big cor corporations will have to engage with those um, well-grounded, resilient systems, as opposed to extract from, you know, Walmart right. goes into town and extracts. Uh, they take over, the they crush it legally, they crush it, you know, physically, and they extract. Um, but now the future Walmart would have to engage with a resilient system and add value, bring value to that system as opposed to extract from that system. And by the way, then public policy is easy to fix because you say, well, we just need more of that. What policies would support that? Well, today we need to show what that looks like in order to have a conversation with, it, with the politicians about what policies we need. Yep, yeah, and I, and I see policy, just like you were saying earlier, as being a, a fundamental structure because of how that's designed is either gonna en enable health of that system or it could completely disengage or degrade it. So I wanna open here just the last few minutes we have with, is there, um, in rhythm teams, any questions that we wanna bring forth from those in the chat field that we could ask John? I see that you're probably reading some of them too. Is anything standing out for you, John, that you want to? I don't read fast enough. <laughs> um... We have a couple of questions coming in. Um, one from, I think, Hannah, how does patriarchy play into the barriers to regenerative? And we had another question from Susan that I'll just read at the same time because I know I want to make the best use of our time here. She said, should we question the assumption there is something to give up? 
So those are those are great questions. I don't know if it's the same, Susan, but Susan also asked about blockchain and holochain. So um, I'll try to tackle that one too. So, um, um, well, <laughs> let me start with blockchain and holochain. So I, I, I don't, I'm not an expert at this at all, but I'm, uh, we're, we're learning about a, prog a project called Seeds, um, but, but I have huge optimism around new money systems that are designed to create the behavior we want and, and, um, uh, and, and create a diversity of money systems that, um, that are much more resilient than the current money system. Uh, it's a whole long conversation, but, but I just want to thank Susan for raising that. The, the other uh, comment Susan made was about, say it again, are we questioning are, is, are, are, is there, the, the question was around, is there something that we have to give up? Oh, yeah. um, you know, yes, for sure. I mean, um, I'll start with one of my uh, favorite ones, you know, for billionaires to drive around on 400 foot yachts that consume diesel fuel uh, on a scale that is literally hard to imagine. You know, it's measured in gallons per minute, not miles per gallon. Um, and and uh, for no purpose other than extreme luxury for a handful of people, probably falls off the page of what's acceptable ethically when we have, again, using my lifeboat analogy, you know, 10 buckets of water for 10 people. There are some things that are simply going to need to fall away. Um, um, but I think the COVID crisis is teaching us that a lot of the things, and, and this is a, you know, I have to first say, I'm one of the privileged who, it, who the COVID crisis, you know, has allowed me to live in many ways a more enjoyable life than I was living before, because I'm doing this call uh, without having to deal with airports um, and, um, and whatnot. So, um, uh, but, I, but I think it is helping us remember what we really value. And um, so, so yes, I would say we're gonna need to give up some things and we ought to prioritize what we give up based on its damage that it does, both to humans and society as well. You know, fashion, fast fashion, you know, has to end, simple. Uh, and the damage that does to human beings as well as the environment is, is unacceptable. Um, so there's, there's definitely things we have to give up, but, but I firmly believe that there are so many more things that we're not realizing right now and, and not living and experiencing right now. We'll look back and say, what, what, what were we doing? Um, it, it, you know, we're really stupid. Um, and then, I'm sorry, Alex, I forgot now the, the first question that you raised. I totally forgot what it was now. Um, <laughs> so did I, um, maybe if, if anyone feels like we're missing their question, they could repost it. We do have another one from Eric. I'm sorry. I've been reading so many of the chats. Um, I'll bring up Eric's. Okay. I would be curious to hear John's take on a steady state economy, its feasibility and how we could get there. Um, and I'm just scrolling to a second question. So one steady one state back, economy. If we go back, it was about, uh, hierarchy. There's oh, a thank you. Oh, yeah, I knew it was important. The patriarchy, so, that was right. Patriarchy. I'm glad whoever raised that, I'm so glad you raised it. Um, another book I highly recommend is called uh, Chalice and the Blade. Um, and um, it, it opened my eyes to uh, the history of patriarchy in human culture in a way that I had never imagined as a man. Typically, we don't even think about this stuff. But again, you know, don't don't take it as John's opinion that this is a problem. Let's go back to our living systems principles. Well, one of them is in balance. And, and perhaps the thing that is most out of balance in our human culture, much less human economy, is the imbalance between the masculine and the feminine. And um, if we go to indigenous wisdom, of course, if anything, the the feminine, the divine feminine was the more dominant of those two, although they both need to be in balance. And so uh, everything that's competitive, extractive, uh, you know, all the things wrong with our human economy uh, could be attributed to, and, and by the way, racism and colonialism and 
and and um, uh, all of the, the the agony and suffering that those have caused have roots in a patriarchy uh, kind of approach to human society. So uh, that's actually an area of interest that I'm digging much deeper into myself now. So I'm really glad whoever raised that. Um, awesome. Well, I, I know we're getting over time, so I want to transition us to one of the things the In Rhythm team was doing in the middle of this conversation is starting to capture a little bit of what you were describing, John, in terms of how we would design a regenerative economy. So I, I want to turn it over to Jeff real quick, and Jeff has the opportunity to share a screen and actually just share a little story, but with a form that we've used to help people land this in an in a operational and a design way. So Jeff? Jeff, you're on mute. Thank you, Trey. Thank you, John. And yes, uh, this was called a design sprint, which meant you all were designing and we were sprinting in the background trying to capture it all. And uh, what we were capturing, we want to share now, and I'll share in my, my screen here. And so we were capturing the discussion in our regenerative framework, which we see as a design framework. And this can be used as both um, kind of a process view going left to right, but also just different qualities when designing a regenerative project. In this case, um, this we are looking at the qualities of designing a regenerative economy. This is what we were trying to capture. And so we see the uh, foundations of that design being context which includes the purpose of what you are designing, the quality of life that one is trying to create um, while achieving that purpose, the behaviors that we are needing to exhibit and uh, wishing others to exhibit, and then the supporting environment, which are the nested systems that we are part of. And I'll, I'll go into some detail of this in a second. I know it's too small for you to read the post-its at the moment. Um, and a design element that most of us think about, I'll jump for a second, most of us think a lot about, well, what work are we going to do then? So what, is, what, is it, what work are we going to create to design a regenerative economy? And what are the ultimate outcomes of that regenerative economy, which is we capture in abundance? And one thing we spend a lot of time on at In Rhythm is seeing that work and abundance are emergent properties of health. Um, so we truly design the project or design the organization um, with a regenerative framework in mind, which is we, how do we, what aspects of the health of the system do we need to pay attention to? Health being defined in social systems as the flow of energy or thriving members, an information cycle, meaning what, what ideas, what assumptions need to die, the, the connections that we are part of, and then our communication cycles. And the way we affect health, the way we create conditions for emergence is through structures. So just to give a few examples, and we can share this with everyone um, uh, when, when we finished here, but capturing what John and Trey were discussing, the purpose of a regenerative economy then, of course, is to, some notes we captured there, that we're regenerating well-being, we are understanding that living systems can regenerate human economies. How do living systems work and where is economy in conflict was the purpose uh, of this idea of a regenerative economy. The qualities of life, which in this case is both the quality of life in creating this, but also is a quality of life in, in, in what would be created through a regenerative economy, is what you said, John, around flourishing, abundance, and beauty, and bioregionalism. The behaviors, we, we put your eight principles here, and of course the eight principles undercut the whole framework, but in many ways they, they outline how a regenerative economy would need to behave to be able to create the conditions for health and create the abundance that we are uh, discussing. As part of that, we you know, uh, put this quote about you know, not confusing the fingers pointing at the moon with the moon itself as a posture. It's a behavior that that John is bringing to this work saying these are not the you know my principles and I'm right no matter what it's saying this is one way of looking at living systems but living systems principles 
just are, right? And that this is all based upon the patterns and principles we see of living systems. The supporting environment then are, are what is the nested systems um, that are part of this creation and that need to be affected in terms of creating a regenerative economy. So it's, you'll see there, it's everything from John's personal story, a huge list of the lineage of, of information and writers and thinkers that you mentioned, John, at the bottom, as well as recognizing at the end of our conversation that we will need to work with the larger systems that we're part of, including anti-racist work, including uh, dismantling patriarchy, including understanding what is out of balance with, um, uh, with nature. And that we are offering something, as you said early on, John, you know, this is something that's not stuck between this false choice of socialism versus capitalism. What we tried to capture in health then is energy flow is about what, in this case, what would thriving members be? In this case, I think the thriving members are local economies, as you mentioned this throughout. This is, would be the, the unit of measurement, the, the membership of a global regenerative economy would be each local economy. Um, and so if we are focused on local economies thriving, then we are honoring place and community, one of, your, one of the eight principles, and creating that thriving local economies as members. Information cycle is trying to capture in the same way that nutrients need to be recycled in a physical system and an agriculture system, in social systems and rhythm uh, sees it as it's information that needs to be recycled. So we ask the question, what information, what assumptions um, need to die in order to give life to something new? And so we mentioned a lot of things here around the current thinking around economic systems, and I'm sure there's, there's many more, but that's some of the things we mentioned. Um, network connections then is what is the relationship between what we're creating and the network that we know it's part of. It's very closely related to um, the supporting environment, but here it's more about what's the diversity of that network. What are the, what's the um, design of those network connections? How nodal is it? How, what is our relationship to the rest of our network? And we uh, mentioned some networks that we would need to influence, including public corporations, the secondary market that you mentioned, John, um, and policy. And communication cycle then is how does each part of this project, each, each part of the system integrate um, Am I still here? Okay, uh, we got Zoom lines crossing. Uh, Alex, can you tell Jen she cannot log on to this? Will not do. to close this out? Yeah. I will, yeah, Thanks. thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, communication cycle is how does each aspect of the regenerative system integrate information, evaluate information and and be able to represent it and communicate it to another part of the system. And so we felt this was very in line with your principles about robust circulation. Um, so the structures then, as Trey asked a number of questions on, are the difference between structure and work, we spend a lot of time in rhythm talking about. Work is the strategies one puts in place. Structures are what needs to be put in place to create this health. And so some of the things that we taught you and Trey talked about were needing to think about the roles and responsibilities of different aspects um, of the economy, secondary markets, public corporations, um, incentives, uh, tax incentives, as well as you mentioned, uh, you know, creativity around ownership structures um, as a key way of creating some of these aspects of health, as well as overall design um, of the um, of the economy itself. We touched in the end, some questions, okay, what are our strategies then? It sounds like there was a lot more work we could be doing there, but at the end you're you saying, hey, it starts with ourselves, figuring out what our unique essence is. John mentioned the Regenerative Communities Network as a key strategy of bringing this vision to life within the Capital Institute. Talk, uh, mentioned working with food systems, and working with uh, big corporations in ground, uh, 
engage with well-grounded resilient systems. And then the last column then is really a description of what is the emergent properties of putting everything else in place in this design framework. So if we are doing work that's in context, if we are building structures that create conditions for health, then ultimately it is this, the ultimate outcome is this economy that is beautiful, abundant and flourishing, not based in fear, abuse, competition and violence. It's less extractive and we have resilient place-based economies and ultimately um, solving complex issues like climate change. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. And just, and I sure appreciate allowing us the little extra time that we're taking from you guys, but we're gonna make that available. Uh, but John, just any closing thoughts and, and what we captured there for you as we were trying to you know, have this conversation around the regenerative economy? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've been through the in rhythm framework a couple times now, and every time I, I learn more. But I, I, I guess I would say I, I it's a little bit um, dense at first, but as you, as you keep taking more tastes, it starts to taste better and better. So I would encourage <laughs> folks to, uh, to uh, give it some, uh, give it, a, give it a try. Um, I, I think most importantly is this focus on the structures for, for me getting clear about the structures that enable the health to arise effortlessly um, is you know is probably the, the the key secret so much of what we're doing in trying to make the world a better place just feels like a fight and that's true if it's trying to regulate wall street and it's true if you're trying to end racism and and yet um the the hope is that if we get the structures more aligned with living systems, uh, prosperity and abundance will emerge more effortless, effortless, effortlessly. And I, I truly believe that's the possibility. Awesome. So I guess that's my, my closing comment. Great. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We appreciate all the interaction and chat. Thank you, Jeff and Alex and Jen, for continuing to support all this. Um, Alex, any closing thoughts before we close it out for the group? Yeah, so just as, you know, it's already been said, but we'll share this recording with you all and it's shareable beyond this group. So feel free to, um, yeah, share it beyond this group with anyone who you think might be interested. We'll share a PDF copy of this design work that we did. And, you know, I know there were a number of questions that came through the chat that we didn't have the time to get to. And please send us an email and we'd, we'd love to continue the conversation with you. Definitely want to make sure Nobody's questions are lost, so please get in touch. And just thanks for taking the extra time. Thank you, John and Trey, for um, leading us through this. And yeah, for everyone's time today, and Jeff and Jen for helping to capture. And look forward to continuing this conversation. Hopefully, this is just the beginning. Hey, Alex. Can I? Hey, can John. I go for it. Comment. I just looking in the chat, and the and the question we never got to was the steady state economy. And I think this is a really important point, maybe. Um, so Herman Daly has developed this idea of a steady state economy, which hasn't gotten as much traction as it maybe should have. And the distinction between that, the idea that we need to move toward this sort of not growing economy, steady state, even though things within it are growing and dying. The, the regenerative idea is that there's all kinds of potential that we don't yet see. So it's a much more hopeful vision than a steady state vision, which feels like we're stuck with what we got and we just got to figure out how to do with what we can. And that's no criticism of Herman, but it is to say that the regenerative framework, the living systems framework is a, um, uh, is a much more abundance filled and potential filled idea than imposing constraints on current economic thinking. So I just want to leave that as a hopeful message. And it's not just talk. Uh, I've experienced that in my own investment project, so I know it's real. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was wonderful to see everybody participating. Thank you for staying as long as you did, and, and uh, blessings on all of you as you continue to put uh, these principles to work in your own lives. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye-bye.